So this is the 10th anniversary of the uh, Techno Progressive Declaration that we adopted in Paris back in 2014. So I wanted to briefly review why we um, made that initiative and what's happened since that I think we didn't anticipate. The first uh, thing to say is that um, as we've heard in this meeting, the history of transhumanism is uh, bound up with a lot of left-wing people, people who were involved in the French Revolution, people who were involved in uh, British progressive thought, uh, Irish, you know, communists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we're often depicted these days in the media as being elitists, being aligned with eugenics, uh, being a right-wing movement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is the kind of puzzle. Is, um, if we want to respond to that, um, the response can't be, well, we're all left-wing, because we're not, but um, at least some of us who are left-wing should be able to articulate what a left-wing version of all these ideas are so that we can respond to some of these critiques. Um, and when I was the executive director of the World Transhumanist Association, uh, I'm a sociologist, so I did a lot of surveys, um, and we did surveys in 2003, 5, and 7, asking, among other things, uh, what people's politics were, and um, if you take everything kind of left of center, tech, uh, libertarian socialist, a communist, a social democrat, American style liberal, et cetera, et cetera. It adds up to about 36 to 47%, depending on the survey. Libertarians are about 20 to 22%. Uh, conservatives, Christian Democrats, conservative and far right, were about four to 2%. So um, we're definitely not a right-wing movement. We're not even a libertarian movement. Um, we are a, a very diverse movement movement and uh, left people on the left um, generally outnumber people on the right within uh, transhumanism. Um, the term techno-progressive began to appear in 2007, and about that time about 16% of the WTA membership identified with that term. We had then the proliferation of a variety of techno-progressively aligned uh, organizations or initiatives. There was briefly a techno-progressive caucus in the Italian Socialist Party. Uh, David Wood has been writing books of trying to flesh out what a techno-progressive public policy would look like. The work of the French Technoprog was, of course, very central to fleshing this out. Um, and there have been other organizations and initiatives uh, over time. In 2013, at the IET, um, I uh, again surveyed the IET membership, and I think it was about 500 people responded. Um, and of those who identified with the term techno-progressive, they had strong support for transhumanism, abortion rights, environmentalism, dignity and dying, disability rights, secular humanism, so forth. So things that at least uh, in many people's minds would be left of center. And um, if you're familiar with me over the last 20 years, this is uh, something I often talk about, but the fact that our contemporary politics are basically have two dimensions, the economic dimension and a cultural dimension. In Citizen Cyborg, I had kind of proposed that technology might be a third dimension to politics. I have recanted that view. Um, it seems quite clear now that uh, science and technology optimism, or, uh, if you ask people about whether artificial intelligence is going to be good for society, whether uh, you should be able to clone your kids, uh, whether you want a brain computer inter implant, things like that. People with higher education um, and people who are cultural liberals tend to say yes and be more positive and uh, religious traditionalists in particular tend to be more hostile. And um, so there has been a kind of alignment of this dimension of politics, which is also sex and gender, it's uh, religious secularism dimension, et cetera, et cetera. And um, what's still quite diverse is our views about economics and the state. And so um, clearly we have libertarian transhumanists who articulate that point of view. What we have not had so much as people in this part of the dimension uh, trying to figure out what the uh, left of center version of all this might look like. Now, of course, um, if you want this, I have the slides and uh, a more attractive version of the declaration available. But when the declaration was drafted, we, we started working on it before the meeting. 
And then we had a Techno Progressive Caucus meeting at the Transvision and refined it and then adopted it. And then about 70 people and organizations around the world signed on endorsing the basic ideas of the declaration. So it starts with the statement, the world is unacceptably unequal and dangerous. Emerging technologies could make things dramatically better or worse. What we're trying to get at with this is that we were rejecting both uh, a kind of Andreessen-like techno-optimism that everything will turn out good in the future, a techno-libertarian, you know, uh, uh, pan, uh, panglossian view of the world. And we're also, of course, re rejecting the notion that technology would inevitably lead to bad things. Uh, the point is just that uh, techno-progressives should always say there could be positive and negative outcomes, and let's steer away from the negative and towards the positive. We also said then, unfortunately, too few people understand the dimensions of the threats and rewards that humanity faces. It's time for techno-progressives, transhumanists, and futurists to step up our political engagement. And of course, this is kind of an appeal to our sense of uh, our, our privilege as people who are futurists and have the capacity to try to think about the future, and then our obligation um, that with that privilege comes uh, our, our need to, this is Cassandra, by the way, this is Oppenheimer, this is Cassandra, uh, people who had the obligation to tell uh, what they thought might be the dangers ahead. Um, we also then said our core commitment is that both technological progress and democracy are required for the ongoing emancipation of humanity from its constraints. Technology could exacerbate inequality or catastrophic risks in the coming future, but things might turn out better if they're well regulated. So this is um, a kind of our fudge that um, democracy is good and te technology is generally good, but when they're together, they're synergistically much better. And so let's try to make sure that they progress uh, jointly. We also then said we are partisans of the promises of the Enlightenment, and we have many other cousins who are descendants of the Enlightenment movements, and our, part of our obligation is to reach out to them and say, look, uh, there's a technological dimension to all the rights f to which you are aspiring. If, you're, if it's reproductive rights, there's technology involved. If it's disability rights, there's technology involved. So we have to identify our cousins and kind of pull them into a family gathering. We then also said, uh, beginning with our shared commitment to individual self-determination, we can build solidarity with. This is uh, uh, a picture of the rights of man from the French Revolution. Um, and so the basic idea here, which I said yesterday, is I think the core of transhumanism is the claim of morphological freedom, cognitive liberty, and reproductive freedom, a claim to control your brain, your body, and your reproduction. Um, and the uh, liberal individualism that is behind that is shared by both social democratic and libertarian views. Uh, we have different understandings of what it takes to protect those rights, but we all uh, start with this foundational principle. So then we mentioned a variety of movements, the cousins, um, worker movements, uh, reproductive rights, movements for drug law reform, disability rights, sex and gender, digital rights. Um, and the idea here is that there uh, are campaigns, movements, issues that we can engage with all of these movements. So for instance, you know, the psychedelic decriminalization that's happening in the states and other countries is fantastic and is a prelude to the kinds of uh, rights to cognitive enhancement access that we want in the future. Uh, as I said yesterday, trans rights are to me kind of uh, transhumanist shock troop uh, issues, fertility rights for LGBT people, for instance, another issue. But of course, the, for me, uh, the issue of technological unemployment and universal basic income, although not directly transhumanist in the sense that it relates directly to human enhancement, um, is broadly transhumanist in the sense of looking ahead to what consequences uh, uh, wide access to artificial intelligence is going to have on the labor market. And techno-libertarians tend to dismiss the consequences of technological unemployment, either arguing that capitalism will always create jobs, or that a post-scarcity society will make any kind of redistribution unnecessary. So a techno-progressive might emphasize more uh, the need for a generous redistributive universal basic income in order to uh, prepare for or 
respond to technological unemployment. So fortunately, in the last 10 years, we have seen some political movement on universal basic income, and uh, COVID was a big boost for that as well. The income supports that various governments gave during COVID uh, validated in the United States, the income supports um, halved or uh, cut to a third infant uh, child or, uh, child um, poverty in the United States. And of course, then that was removed. But um, still, the idea of universal basic income was taken up by Andrew Yang, who ran for president in 2020, and um, uh, by a number of other left-wing thinkers who have been making it a centerpiece of their own post-capitalist divisions. I would say our most popular proposal as transhumanists, but also in a techno-progressive frame, is um, universal uh, access to anti-aging medicine. Um, we see that uh, society is graying, and there's going to be an increasing fiscal burden of disability. Fertility is dropping, and we're going to have increasing fights over generational equity between retiring seniors and uh, younger people who are paying for them. Um, and so we're gonna to have to have a, a strong investment in keeping older people healthy longer so that our burdens on society are, are less. Um, but in general, I think we all have an interest in living longer. So um, this is clearly when we ask people what kinds of um, technological innovations would you like, uh, the Pew Research Foundation has been doing this kind of research and asked people, what would a future with radical life extension look like? This is from 2021, I think. Um, everyone should be able to get treatments. 79% agree. However, uh, let's see, what the, only the wealthy would have access. Also, 66% agree, right? So they want everyone to have access. They don't think everyone's going to have access because they think only the wealthy are going to get it. So um, if from a techno-progressive point of view, uh, we definitely need to be arguing that not only will we have these radical life extension treatments, but we can make them available to everyone. And that could be the basis of a campaign all itself. Uh, I think Cyril's in the back. Uh, Cyril was especially passionate about this element of the techno-progressive declaration, which is a reference to our wonky, non-anthropocentric, substrate, independent personhood ethics position, uh, the notion that it doesn't make any difference whether you're human or not um, if you have the characteristics of personhood that grant you rights-bearing citizenship in our society, you should have equal rights. And that's the position of the Great Ape Movement, but it's also a debate about robot rights, for instance, which may be coming up, or the rights of cyborgs who are radically modified in various ways. We also made uh, reference to uh, the need to reduce existential risks, not only by educating about them, but proposing transnational cooperation that can address these man-made natural threats that we face. And the advocacy for world government goes back a long time in uh, kind of futurist thinking. H.G. Wells was a passionate advocate for world government. He, I think he mostly thought it was going to happen after a cataclysmic global conflict of some kind. Um, but uh, he'd been, this is, I think Open Conspiracy Blueprints for a World Revolution was written in like 1911. So um, for a long time, he was an advocate for that. So that was the, the long and short of the techno-progressive uh, declaration. It proposed that we had things to do with the futurist community. We had to raise the social question with other futurists and transhumanists and articulate what a social democratic version of uh, our agenda might be. We had an agenda with social movements to challenge them on some of their Luddite or anti-technology skepticism. Um, and we had a, a, an imperative to intervene in public debates and try to build a constituency for um, a political formation around these kinds of pro-technology initiatives. Now, in the aftermath of the techno-progressive declaration, um, we didn't see a lot of people doing techno things in the name of techno-progressivism. It was not a flag that many people carried. Um, in fact, the political parties that, uh, there were a lot of political parties, maybe half a dozen, I think, around the world that got started by various kinds of futurists and transhumanists. Most of them were called transhumanists. The Spanish one was called like Alianza Futurista, and there were, there were other, uh, there's a German uh, life extension party. 
Um, Zoltan Istvan in the States, he drove around the United States in 2016 in a, a bus that was shaped like a coffin, trying to promote his presidential campaign at, and his U.S. transhumanist party, which then he turned over to folks who still run it today. So this is the only survivor that I know of these electoral initiatives that transhumanists launch. And the U.S. transhumanist party illustrates that um, this issue that it's really hard to get social democrats and libertarians to agree about anything and the US transhumanist party still exists because it was consistently libertarian from the beginning um, as far as I understand um, so uh, I think this has been a, a problem and David Wood could say more about this but the kind of the difficulty of coming in and saying everyone from monarchists and Putinists to you know libertarians and uh, Marxist Leninists we all agree about transhumanism right so now we'll have a political party that doesn't work very well because you don't agree about enough the thing that we really didn't expect that happened was the global rise of fascism and the uh, decline of democracy more democracies over the last 15 years have become less democratic uh, more authoritarian regimes have become more authoritarian. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping's even become more authoritarian. Putin's become more authoritarian, um, et cetera, et cetera. Hindutva in India has become more authoritarian, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, American democracy may not survive the year. So um, I don't think any of us expected that that would be the future. I was, I was kind of a left-wing uh, Fukuyamaist in retrospect. I thought that we had reached the end of history. We just had to do a little bit more social democratic work. But everyone was going to agree that liberal democracy was the end of history and everyone was going to become democratic. China would democratize, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't anticipate that we could move backwards this far. And the rise of anti-science populism, uh, which is strongly tied to this right-wing uh, resurgence. Here's Anthony Fauci, who was the kind of the symbol of anti-science populism in the United States. He was our, our uh, public health czar. Um, he, uh, or the, this anti-science populism, I think, is part of what has pushed a political polarization around questions of science and technology optimism uh, to align with the left-right spectrum in ways that I didn't expect at the time. Now, one initiative that did take off in ways that I think is quite instructive and quite impressive um, was the Open Philanthropy Organization and the money that it raised for training a cadre of um, artificial intelligence risk experts that they then gave to Congress and federal agencies. About 80 to 100 experts on AI risk who were all conversant in you know, at AGI and ASI and all the issues that we care about, not just algorithmic risk and some of the other things that, you know, the more pedestrian uh, AI uh, safety people would focus on. It's been a very successful initiative. It's also now somewhat controversial because of the people who were contributing to this initiative and the, the uh, suspicion that they might be trying to achieve some kind of regulatory capture by uh, scaring the hell out of people about, you know, future exit terminator risks when actually they're trying to make money in some way. But um, it's, and so it's not a techno-progressive initiative, but it is uh, a generally positive initiative in my book. Um, it's uh, not as libertarian as, for instance, the rise of the effective accelerationists in the last year who, and you know, like Andreessen, who are much more clearly opposed to any attempt to regulate AI risk. Um, and so I think there could be techno-progressive initiatives like the Open Philanthropy Initiative that would be quite successful, where there's been a campaign for 15 years to increase the uh, budget for the biology of aging research in the U.S. federal agencies, um, we could tr start training a cadre of longevity initiative activists and putting them, you know, giving them to Congress in the same way. But we would need to find billionaires willing to support that, or somebody. Um, I think we also need to be thinking about the coming crises and just preparing for these coming crises because. You know, the, just raising the flag, writing a manifesto and saying this is what we should all be doing, um, it doesn't make any sense if there's not a tangible, concrete, uh, political uh, crisis or uh, campaign that we could connect to that would lead people to start thinking about issues in the way that we were trying to frame them. And so there are many um, possible things that could happen, but just coming back to human enhancement for a second, this is another uh, one of Pew's surveys, they asked people, are you generally more excited than concerned about several potential challenges? 
And people are generally more excited that, about human enhancement than now, than they were in the past. So uh, prevent some people from getting serious diseases, slow the aging process to allow the average person to live decades longer. Broad support, 41% support, 29% concerned. Um, so there is a constituency out there for but if we had, for instance, radical breakthroughs in anti-aging medicine to uh, make sure that we accelerate the clinical approval process, that we get the FDA to actually uh, uh, approve enhancement, drug, enhancement therapies, um, that we include them in some kind of universal access program that's harder in the States since we don't have universal medicine, but easier in Europe. Um, and that, those are the kinds of fights that I think may get people thinking much more explicitly about whether the, a technological future is going to be a positive thing for them or not. Um, also, technological unemployment and universal basic income and the post-work debate, um, if we started to see, we don't see it yet, um, but if we started to see dramatic declines in uh, employment or in the pr proportion of the population in paid employment, then we would have to have policy responses. And um, universal basic income, I think, now would be one of the top policy responses that people would be thinking about. And finally, what we didn't uh, address very much in the Techno Progressive Declaration that uh, clearly the Technoprog has been working on more recently and that we should be thinking a lot about is what um, an, an approach, a techno progressive approach to the climate crisis would be. Now, again, it's a little bit distal from the questions of human enhancement, unless you're under Sonberg and says that we should all be four feet tall and, and <laughs> have chlorophyll or something. But um, uh, usually, um, this, is, this is about our philosophical views about the planet. So for instance, the, the same kind of philosophical views that would lead you to say you shouldn't be intervening in the human body would also be the kinds of, that would lead you to say you shouldn't be intervening in natural ecology. But, you know, I think we're past that point. We have to take responsibility for what we've done to the planet, and we have to uh, reevaluate GMOs and their potential role in um, climate remediation, nuclear power, and, and its relationship to renewables, and things like this. I have written recently about this, if you're curious about what a techno-progressive eco-policy might look like and how it relates to eco-socialism and eco-modernism. So, for more information, uh, you can contact me, and I will send you these slides and the Techno-Progressive Declaration. Thank you very much.